afternoon everybody welcome and thank you so much for coming along to this Dublin Festival of History talk a dangerous stretch of water World War II in the Irish Sea and this talk is in partnership with the Dublin Port Company. The Dublin Festival of History is an annual free festival brought to you by Dublin City Council and organised by Dublin City Libraries. My name is Kate and in a few minutes I'm going to hand over to our speaker for this afternoon but before I do I just want to let you know that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the talk and if you have a question for our speaker you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And for those of you using social media to talk about the festival, you can use our hashtag HISTFest2020. Our speaker today is Dr. Pat McCarthy, who uh, has a PhD and an MBA from UCD and is the author of several books, including The Irish Revolution, 1912 to 23, Waterford and the 1916 Rising, The Redmonds and Waterford, A Political Dynasty, 1891 to 1952. He is currently a research associate in the School of History and Geography, Dublin City University, and is working on a history of the pharmaceutical manufacturing industry in Ireland. We've turned Pat's video off today to try, um, try and make the audio quality as best as it can be, because we were having a, a couple of, um, of internet lags earlier. So um, do bear with us. If, uh, I, hope, I hope that that works out. And um, we, we're also recording this talk, so you can watch back at a future date. So we'll um, let you know on the usual channels once that's available. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Pat McCarthy. Thanks, Kate. A dangerous stretch of water. About 40 years ago, Captain Frank Ford of Arklow published a book, The Long Watch. This was a tremendous pioneering work where Captain Ford looked at the experience of the ships and their crews, the Irish ships and their Irish crews, as they struggled to keep Ireland supplied with essentials such as fuel and food throughout the long period from 1939 to 1945. He chronicled in great detail the experience of the Irish Mercantile Marine in that period. The Irish Mercantile Marine in 1939 consisted of 56 ships, the majority of them small coasters used in the trade between Ireland and the United Kingdom. They had no seagoing vessels. That, far, that 56 ships, there were 41 attacks on them during the war. 13 of them were sunk with the loss of over 150 lives. And thanks to the work of Captain Ford and others, they are suitably commemorated in that lovely memorial on Iron Key in honour of the seamen lost while serving on Irish merchant ships. What I want to do in this talk is to add a little bit to Captain Ford's work. I want to look at the Irish Sea in particular and examine it from two aspects. First of all, where did attacks on Irish shipping fit in with German strategy, with German naval strategy during the war? Why is it that for long periods all was quiet and then for other periods there was intense activity, intense suffering by the um, sailors? many of whom lost their lives. Captain Ford focused on the Irish registered vessels, but there were other ones. There were English vessels that were sunk while entering or leaving Irish ports, and there were other registered vessels. So they're the two aspects that I want to talk about this evening to add to the story of the Irish men who lost their lives. Now, it's very important to put it in this context of German naval warfare. When the war started on the 1st of September 1939, Gross Admiral Rader, Commander in Chief of the German Navy, turned to some of his staff and said, All we can do in this war is show Germany how bravely we died. He said that from the position of weakness of the German Navy. When the war broke out, 
Germany had two serving battle cruisers. The Royal Navy had 15. The Royal Navy had seven aircraft carriers. The Germans had none. And so on through all the ships. The Royal Navy had 200 destroyers. Germany had 24. And even when it came to submarines, Germany was very weak. Admiral Dönitz, commander of the submarine fleet, had studied the experience of the First World War and had concluded that for Germany to effectively blockade Britain and to force its surrender, he would need a force of 300 ocean-going submarines. On the 1st of September, he had 57 submarines, only 27 of which were suitable for service in the Atlantic. No wonder Admiral Raider was so despondent. But Germany had one weapon, which at the time was secret, and that was the magnetic mine. Mines, as the First World War had shown, were very, very effective in sinking ships. But these were contact mines. They relied upon the ship hitting the mine, which was usually moored to the seabed and floating about six or eight feet below the surface. The magnetic mine could be just left on the bottom of the sea, in shallow waters, about 60 feet deep at most, and then if a ship passed over it or near it, without any contact, it would explode, causing immense damage or sinking the ship. And that was the secret weapon that they had. But the Irish Sea, in the first few months, were safe from that weapon. They were safe because the Germans not have the wherewithal to get them to plant these mines in the Irish Sea. In November 1939, the Germans started using them along the north coast, the east coast of England. The Admiral was anxious to expand their use. And in January 1940, a U-boat left Wilhelmshaven in Germany with 16 of the, with 12 of these mines. It sailed around Scotland, managed to torpedo a British battleship, the Barham, on its way, uh, damaging it very severely, and approached the uh, port of Liverpool, completely undetected. And there it planted its 12 mines and returned to Germany. The British were unaware of this, and ships continued to use the port. On the uh, 7th of February, 1940, the Monster, a BNI passenger vessel, uh, under charter to the Belfast Shipping Company, was still flying the Irish flag, was approaching Liverpool when it detonated one of these mines. Our chief officer, Thomas Wrigley, recorded, and I quote, the explosion appeared to come from under the port side of the bridge, and the ship started to settle by the head immediately. All the upper deck hatches had fallen below. The radio equipment was destroyed, so no distress signal could be transmitted. Captain Paisley was injured. Four other crewmen were also injured. The ship was stopped, the lifeboats lowered, and the passengers boarded in a most orderly fashion. We stood by the slowly sinking monster, its propellers rising out of the water as she went down by the head. The monster had been carrying 190 passengers with a crew of 45. All were rescued without loss. A couple of weeks later, another submarine approached the port of um, Cardiff on the 2nd of March. It again planted the mines and there we see, sorry, the monster sunk on the 7th of February without any loss. At the beginning of March, the, um, another minefield was planted by a, a submarine, this time on the approaches to the South Welsh ports of Cardiff and Swansea. 
And on the 3rd of March, the SS Cato was sunk. The Cato was a very, very familiar site in Dublin. For 20 years, it had been chartered by its owners, the Bristol Shipping Company, to Guinness and its cargo on two voyages every week were barrels of Guinness. Now in a scene that's most reminiscent of that novel and film, Whiskey Galore, we're told that after the explosion, many of the barrels, it was carrying 700 of them, floated ashore and the locals took them and buried them in the sand hills from where they were later uh, recovered. But unlike the ship in the film Whiskey Galore, 13 men were killed. Of the 15 crew, 13 were killed and the other two seriously injured. A British ship trading out of Dublin sunk. Other ships were sunk, but these were the two with Irish connections. And in March 1940, they were the only two ships sunk with Irish connections. And no more ships were sunk in the Irish Sea for a couple of months. And the reason was quite simple. The Germans pulled all their boats, U-boats, surface vessels, back to support the invasion of Norway. That was followed in May and June by the invasion of France. So when the Germans returned to the Irish Sea, they were operating out of ports in Brittany, ports and airfields in Brittany. You see Brittany there. In response, the British put a massive minefield across from Cornwall across to the Wexford Waterford coast. They laid that minefield over 30,000 mines in about three weeks. And they ordered all ships, all convoys to go north about. And this was an intensely patrolled area. And so for years, the Irish Sea was a no-go area for German submarines. They simply could not get past the patrols on the north or this massive minefield on the south. But these mines could be dangerous in themselves. While the British maintained the minefield, had a number of channels through it for their ships, which they changed on a regular basis. These kind of mines can break loose. They're moored, they're anchored to the seabed and in storms, they can break loose. They can drift anywhere, and they're indiscriminate. In the 12 months after the laying of this minefield, the Irish Defence Forces reported over 100 mines, all British, washed up on Irish shores that they had to destroy, and others floated on the sea. And it was a constant job of the tiny Irish naval service, the Murakhu and the Fort Rannoch, to destroy these mines when they spotted them floating on the surface. The SS me, but meanwhile, the Germans continued using a small number of planes um, to lay mines in the approaches to Liverpool and in the approaches to the Bristol Channel. Um, the first victim, the first Irish victim of these was the Meath. Again, coming into Liverpool, it triggered a mine, and again the crew were saved. The Ardmore was more tragic. That was on course from Cork to Liverpool on the 11th of November, flying the Irish flag when it struck a mine near the Salty Islands. The mine could have been British, it could have been German, it didn't matter. 20, the complete crew, 24 men, were killed in that. On the 21st of December 1940, the Danish Fallon, en route from Dublin to Liverpool, called into Holyhead 
for clearance, for customs clearance. And as it left, it triggered a mine, which killed four. And there, in the lovely painting by Kenneth King, is his depiction of the ship going down and the lifeboats pulling away from it. As I say, four men were killed. But not only were these planes attacking these ships, or sorry, laying mines, but they also attacked the ships. Now, the German Navy was under an incredible disadvantage. It got no very little assistance, or none at all, from the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. In the 1930s, Germany had, the German Navy had planned to have its own air wing, similar to the British Fleet Air Arm or the RAF's Coastal Command. But Goering, in charge of the German Air Force, had a simple motto, if it flies, it belongs to me. So the German Navy had no air force of its own and was forced on the reluctance of the German of the German Air Force. The only thing, the only aircraft that Goring would allot them in 1940 were some obsolescent flying boats. This type, the Heinkel 59, a squadron of them were, was based in uh, Brest, twin-engined biplane, slightly more modern but still obsolescent, a Dornier 18 also based in Brest. And these had a certain nuisance value, and but could be deadly. They would patrol along the south coast of Ireland, would attack ships. Most notably, they attacked the Kerry Head off the south coast of Ireland on the 22nd of October. And in full view of watchers from the shore, the ship was sunk and the complete crew of 12 were all killed. Occasionally, more modern aircraft could be used. Most noticeably, the famous It had been an airline. It had been converted for military use. It wreaked havoc over the Atlantic. Occasionally, it would fly up the, some of them would fly up the Irish Sea. Um, it tended to bomb from very low altitude. And that was a weakness of the plane. It was a weakness of all the German aircraft when attacking ships. They did not have a good bomb speed. And as a result, it came in very low. And all the British ships were armed here. And on at least two occasions in the Irish Sea, British ships being attacked by German aircraft, the German aircraft struck the mast of the British ship. It was so low. And the aircraft then would crash into the sea. On the 18th of December, a German condor flew up the Irish Sea. Um, it attacked um, a tanker, the Osage, a 1,000 ton tanker, off Arklo. The Osage was on its voyage from Belfast to Foynes, carrying a cargo of um, aircraft fuel for the flying boats in Foynes. It was attacked and sunk by a condor, and um, it, the crew were saved. It then continued on up the Irish coast, attacked a 2,700 ton cargo vessel, the SS Tweed, which was on its way to Dublin. It attacked that, damaged it, but did not sink it. It later made an um, attack on the Cambria, the mail vessel heading for Dunleary. The next day, another condor flew up the Irish Sea. On its return voyage down the Irish Sea, it spotted a small ship, an Irish ship, the SS Lanarone, which you see here. It was had its neutrality markings, 
the condor flew around it, checked it, and then waggled its wings at the Lanarone and flew away. A few miles away, it spotted the Isolde, the Irish light vessel. It was British registered, but was based in Dunleary and crewed by Irishmen. It was not, it did not have neutrality markings, nor did it have any defensive armament, even though it was British registered. It was attacked, sunk, and six of the crew were killed, all of them from Dunleary. The Condor returned to its base at Bordeaux. And there we see that, there we see it. Now on the tail plane, you see the markings, the successes of that particular aircraft in its anti-shipping role. The fifth one from the bottom is the assault. What was a victory for one crew was a tragedy for another crew. And so throughout the winter, there were sporadic attacks on Irish ships and on Irish shipping. 1941, the scenario changed. In February, German headquarters issued an order to the Luftwaffe to operate with the Navy more closely and to attack shipping on, on the um, British coast. Two groups of German bombers, Heinkel 111s, were transferred to Brittany, and from there, they began to operate over the Irish Sea. On the 2nd of March, the Castle Hill, a Belfast Richard boat based in Belfast, was sunk en route from Cork to Newport. It had delivered a cargo of coal to Cork and was on its way back to Newport, and 12 out of the 13 crew were killed. March was a terrible month. If we look at one week that March and look at the Irish ships, on the 24th of March, Glen Cullen and the, was attacked, but no casualties. On the 21st of March, the Glen Cree was attacked, no casualties. The next day, the St. Fintan, operating out of Dublin, was sunk, nine dead. Four days later, the Eden Vale was attacked. On the 27th of March, the Lady Bell was attacked. Both of those without casualties. But in that one week, five Irish vessels were attacked and one of them sunk. And they were not the only ones. There's the Glen Cree. It was a Dublin gas company boat. It spent its life uh, carrying coal from Wales to the gas works. The same week, another Belfast ship, crewed by Belfast men, was en route from Newport to Cork when it was attacked and 10 out of 13 crew killed. And there's a painting by Kenneth King of the St. Fintan. Sometimes the German aircraft carried a photographer with them. And here we see George Fleischmann took this photograph over the Bristol Channel on the 1st of April. On the 2nd of April, the next day, the British tanker, the San Conrado, was just off the Tusker Rock when it was spotted by a German aircraft. Fleischmann, the photographer, was on board and he took a photograph of that direct hit on the tanker, the San Conrado. The crew escaped. After hitting the Conrado, the aircraft then attacked another ship, the Wild Rose, which was just near the Tusker Rock. It damaged severely the Wild Rose. The two lifeboats were damaged, but luckily enough, the Carlogue, an Irish registered vessel, spotted this, came near, took the crew off, and took the Wild Rose in tow. And even though the Wild Rose was sinking, 
it managed to get it as far as Ross Lair, where it was beached. It was later patched up, towed up to Dublin and repaired. And for their efforts, the High Court awarded the crew of the Kerr Logue the not unsubstantial sum of £4,000 for the rescue. I mentioned the Lady Bell being attacked there. That's the Lady Bell putting into Waterford after the attack, listing seriously to one side because of the damage. Another ship that was sunk, the Beggar Inn. The Beggar Inn was Wexford owned, Wexford captain, Wexford manned, but it was registered in the UK. The name is interesting, Beggar Inn. It's called after a small island in Wexford Harbour, which is now part of the North Slobs. It was attacked and sunk, but without any loss of life. The attacks continued. On the 13th of June, the mail boat out of Rosslair, servicing the Rosslair fish card run, was attacked and, and 30 were killed. The St. Patrick had been attacked on no less than four previous occasions. Um, but it had always survived. It had been lucky. It was also relatively well armed with six guns. As I said earlier, the British ships were all armed. As it approached Fishguard, it was bombed by aircraft. One bomb struck the ship between the bridge and the funnel, penetrated the fuel tanks and set them on fire. The vessel broke in two and sank within minutes. Of the 45 crew and 44 passengers on board, 30 were killed. 17 crew, one of the gunners, and 12 passengers. Among the dead were Captain James Faraday and his 20-year-old son, Jack. Jack was interested in a career at sea, and to give him a little bit of experience before he began his training as a merchant officer, his father brought him along on board that day. Both of them were killed. In that period, July 1940 to June 1941, ships were sunk in the Irish Sea, 53 by air attack, 45 by mines, and at least eight of them were sunk while trading with Irish ports, either journeying to an Irish port or from an Irish port. March 1941, 26 ships were sunk in the Irish Sea. Most of them British registered, but some like the St. Fenton, Irish registered. 20 of them by air attack. It was a very, very dangerous stretch of water. And it does raise the question, all the British ships were armed and, and could defend themselves. And some of them did so very effectively. Should Irish registered ships have been armed? That was discussed in April 1941 with representatives of the Department of Defence, Department of uh, Supplies, and the Department of Foreign Affairs. And it was agreed that it would be impractical to arm Irish ships. If you watched Michael Kennedy yesterday evening on his wonderful talk on the emergency, the Irish forces were consistently short of arms. They did not have enough guns or trained gunners to register, sorry, to arm the ships. And Joe Walsh of the Department of Foreign Affairs reminded, told the attendants that the German minister reminded me that no guarantee was ever given that Irish ships flying between Ireland and England would be free from attack. In other words, he said, you know what you're letting yourself in for. You are taking your chances. But it was also a pretty dangerous place for German aircraft. At least 20 of them were either shot down or were so damaged that two of them 
uh, sought refuge in Irish airspace to crash land there. One of them there, crash landing in County Waterford. You can see the front of the aircraft is destroyed. German aircraft were fitted with explosives so that the aircraft would be destroyed if it had to crash land. They didn't work on that, so the crew just destroyed the cockpit. There's the Irish soldiers inspecting it. But just as soon, just as suddenly as the attacks had begun at the beginning of March, they faded away. They stopped almost completely. The reason being, from the middle of June on, all the Luftwaffe was moving east to take part in Hitler's assault on Russia. And throughout July, August, September, there were relatively few attacks from the handful of German aircraft that were left behind. In October, they were temporarily reinforced. And there were a number of attacks in October in the Irish Sea. One of them was on a Norwegian ship, the SS Rask. While it was killed, sorry, eight of the crew were killed. It was sunk off Ross there by air attack while flying between Cork to Newport. The Cork to Newport run was a very busy run, carrying mostly coal. So there were eight Norwegian sailors killed on that, bringing supplies to Ireland. But after that brief flurry, and again in October, the question of arming Irish ships was discussed, but the conclusion was the same. But with all the attention on the Eastern Front, the Luftwaffe was no longer in a position to mount effective attacks in the Irish Sea. That's another Irish ship, small one, pl plying a straight out of Dundalk. It was traveling between Dundalk and Liverpool when it was attacked. A couple of the crew were wounded, slightly wounded. After October 1941, the Irish Sea became primarily a quiet place that the British could use for training their anti-submarine forces and were very few attacks. Occasionally, the Germans would fly a Junkers 88 up the Irish Sea on reconnaissance, trying to find out what ships were there. On the 23rd of August, a German aircraft flew up the Irish Sea. By now, the RAF had a very, very strong presence over the Irish Sea. It was picked up by radar and attacked by Spitfires flying out of um, Pembry Airport there. It continued on. It was again picked up by radar and attacked by Spitfires, this time from Valley and from the Isle of Man. It was damaged in an effort to escape. It flew over Ireland, where it was attacked by two Spitfires flying from Northern Ireland who came down to join in. They attacked the aircraft over Meath, damaged it severely, but returned fire shot down one of the RAF Spitfires, which crashed in County Meath, killing the pilot, a Polish exile. The German aircraft continued on trying to get back to France. By two more Spitfires flying from Wales, who forced it to crash land. We're told it was a summer, it was a lovely summer's day, um, a Sunday, and Tremor there was full of holiday makers. And the two Spitfires flew back and forth across the bay, entertaining the crowd with aerobatics and with victory rolls before returning to Wales. And there was a German aircraft as it in a field in Waterford. But that was one of the last German aircraft to fly up the Irish Sea. And the Irish Sea was very peaceful for the rest of 42, for 43, and for almost all of 44. 
And by the beginning of October 1944, the British, the Royal Navy, were very confident, very happy. They had won the Battle of the Atlantic. They had destroyed the U-boat fleet. In 1943, fierce battles in the middle of the Atlantic had resulted in catastrophic U-boat losses, which continued in the Bay of Biscay. And when the remaining U-boats tried to attack the invasion fleet in June 1944, again they were defeated. So it seemed as if the war was over until at, in October, sorry, that's the German aircraft, the, a Liberty ship, the SS Dan Beard, was sunk just outside Milford Haven. And the next day, two more ships, Liberty ships, were attacked and damaged by a submarine. The appearance of submarines in the Irish Sea came as a major surprise to the Royal Navy. It was totally unexpected. The few remaining U-boats were now based in Norway, and Dönitz decided in a last gamble to send them into the shallow waters, the inshore waters. And there, and one of them had penetrated the Irish Sea had sunk those. Next day, we went further up the Irish Sea. Sank the Normandy coast, sorry, uh, it was further up the Irish Sea, sunk another ship, and then returned to Norway and conveying to Dönitz that there was, in the, in the words of the officer, it was a target-rich zone, the Irish Sea, and it was possible to get past the mine barrier at the southern approaches. So Dennis began to send in more, and one of them sunk on the 24th of January 1945. It sunk the Normandy coast, which had been a very frequent visitor to Dublin during the emergency. On that day, it was sailing between London and Liverpool when it was sunk. But the, RA, the Royal Navy reacted. They had plenty of escort vessels. And soon the Irish Sea and the Irish coastal waters became a very dangerous stretch of water again, but this time for the U-boats. When HMS Manners was attacked and damaged off the Isle of Man, four other escorts attacked the U-boat and hunted it down. When the corvette HMS Vervain was sunk off the coast of Waterford, again the U-boat was hunted down. In a very short period, you can see on this map, these the yellow symbols are U-boats sunk in the Irish Sea, all sunk in 1945. Three trying to enter via the north, three there, four trying to enter from the south or in the southern approaches to the Irish Sea. And most of them were sunk with the loss of all hands and without sinking any ships, merchant ships. It was a complete victory for the Royal Navy and a very costly one for the U-boats. The war ended beginning of May but not before a final tragedy. On the 2nd of May, the small fishing boat, the Nave Garavon, set out from Ardmore for fishing. It snagged a mine, a floating mine. When it tried to free itself from the mine, the mine exploded, killing the three crew, a father, a son, and another crewman. So when When we look at that lovely memorial there on Iron Key, I think, apart from the Irishmen, we should also think of all those others who died in that very dangerous stretch of water. Michael Kennedy yesterday spoke at length about the threat to Irish neutrality. But if it wasn't for these ships, 
the Irish ships and the other registered ships, the other registered vessels registered in Norway or um, Greece or in the United Kingdom and their crews and those men who died, maintaining that neutrality would have been very, very difficult. We owe them all a debt. Thank you very much. Right. Any questions? Thank you so much, Pat, for that brilliant and very sobering talk. Um, really, really interesting. And I think we, we're all very appreciative of, of certainly of, of the number of photographs that you've managed to source, um, which is absolutely brilliant. So now um, is your opportunity, everybody, to ask Pat some questions. So use the Q&A box down at the bottom to type those in and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, we've had a couple through already. Um, one of the questions uh, comes from Michelle and she um, asks if you can recommend any readings um, specifically covering an event um, involving the sinking of the Irish merchant ship Kyle Clare in the Bay of Biscay, if that's familiar to you, whether you can recommend where she can find out a bit more about that. Well, your library should certainly have a copy of Frank Ford's book. The Long Watch, the one um, which I showed the cover of at the very beginning. That is an excellent book on the Irish registered ships and it gives full details, the crew details. Your local library either should have a copy or should be able to get a copy of it and that is a great starting point for it. Yes, Michelle mentions that book in a follow-up comment, and it sounds like that it's uh, not in the library catalogue, but perhaps that's a good piece of advice, Michelle, to talk to the libraries and see if they can get a copy in. Well, see, the libraries have an inter interlibrary lending scheme, and most of them are quite good at getting books in for it. So it's always worth asking, even if it's not in the catalogue. Now, if you're located in or near Dublin, the National Library, will obviously have a copy. And the Central Reference Library, the Central Library in Pier Street, I'm sure they would have a, a copy of it. Thank you. Um, another question here, did the vessels get mine countermeasures later in the war? The Irish ships did not. They fitted um, the English vessels when they discovered how the magnetic mine worked. They were fitted with what was called a degaussing thing, which counteracted the magnetic field. The idea behind the magnetic mine was that the iron in the ship has a magnetic field. As it passed over the ship, I'm oh, sorry, over the mine, it activated the mine. To counter that, the British developed what they called degaussing, which was, um, generated a counter magnetic field and it so the magnetic mine would not work. Irish ships were not fitted with them. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions here about the Isolde that you mentioned in the talk. Um, yeah. so, uh, um, someone says that um, in the Luftwaffe magazine uh, the Isolde is referred to as Irish lights as the vessel had that painted in large letters on the side. And this is also in Kenneth King's painting. Would that have, um, presumably that wouldn't have flagged with them as a neutrality message? No, that would not have flagged them within, as a neutrality message. In a way, the, the soul, because it was registered in Britain, we did not use the great big tricolors that were painted on the side, which was a neutrality. Now, they were not necessarily a protection, as the St. Fintan found, as other Irish ships, but it was some. But then equally, because it was based in Dunleary, it was an Irish, the Irish lights vessel, it did not have armament, whereas all the other British registered ships, after about September 1940, were carried armament. Usually that armament consisted of at least one 12-pounder gun, and anything up to five or six machine guns. So they were fair, they could defend themselves. The Irish ships were totally dependent on respectful, respectful neutrality. Thank you. 
Uh, Lee asks, what happened to all of the mines that were left in the sea after the war was over? There was a massive effort by the Royal Navy in conjunction with the Irish um, Naval Service to sweep those mines. Literally weeks and months, there were squadrons of Royal Naval vessels. Now, what, what you tended to do was you used what was called a paravane to cut the um, the cable that was holding it to the bottom, to the seabed. The mine would then come to the surface and you would either try to sink it or to explode it by rifle fire. You didn't actually collect them all up and bring them back home. You tried to destroy them out at sea with by either by rifle fire, by sinking it, or causing it to explode. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, Joe asks, was the photographer Fleischmann mentioned, the one who was later interned in the Curragh when his aircraft was shot down? He was an Austrian who stayed on here after the war and became a well-known photographer. Yes, that's the man. He was one of those who joined the Germans in the Curragh. Thank you. Uh, another question here from um, Michelle. Was there any criticism of the Irish government for failing to protect Irish ships as a neutral country in the papers of the day? Well, the papers were well, were well censored, first of all. So no criticism was allowed in the papers of the policy of neutrality. And most people accepted that you were depending, if you like, on the goodwill almost, not to it of the uh, combatants to uh, not to attack the um, Irish ships. In some cases, that was respected, as we saw with the Lanarone, but particularly in the middle of the Atlantic, where a U boat would be depending on its periscope very often, and on a number of occasions, Irish ships plainly marked were sunk by U boats, but you have to bear in mind the U-boat may not necessarily have seen. It would put up the periscope for a brief second to fix the angle of, of our attack and then would fire the torpedo. So it was the only one, but there was no criticism during the war and very little after the war. And even after the war, it's worth bearing in mind that until Frank Ford did his tremendous work, the sacrifice of these men had been more or less forgotten about. And yet their contribution to keeping Ireland neutral, to maintaining our neutrality policy was absolutely critical. Thank you. Um, there was a question here, let me try and find it again. It was a very good one. Um, a lot of them coming in, bear with me a sec. Uh, a lot of interest in this subject. Um, here, here it is, it's from Helen. Uh, she asks, uh, well, first of all, she says, excellent presentation. Um, and I was wondering what role the coast watching service had in watching the Irish Sea during World War II? Well, you know, they, as I said, were coast watching. They were very good at it. But very often they would record, in the Irish Sea, they would record such and such a ship being uh, attacked. They would record if the ship was sunk or if the ship was damaged. They recorded it, but that was all they could do. And they would alert, sometimes they would alert the lifeboat to go to, uh, to the rescue of lifeboats. And very often, the ships that were sunk, they often went down with all, uh, with all the crew. And sometimes the bodies would be seen floating ashore. And that would be recorded by the um, observation um, by the local observation posts, you know. So they were observers, and sometimes they were observers of real tragedy. Thank you. Um, John asked uh, a, a, a thing that you've noticed, I suppose, in some of the images. The Irish flag seems to be in reverse on all of the ships, i.e., orange, white, and green. Is there a reason for that? I didn't, I have to be honest, I didn't notice that myself, you know, on the, I don't think there was. 
Uh, Maura asks, were there any photographers on the Irish fleet? On the Irish fleet, on the Irish uh, ships? No, none that we are aware of. None that left any in any of the archives that were there. Some of the ships, like I searched and searched for that one, the Osage, which is sunk just off Arklo, of for um, images of it. And I couldn't find any image of it. But what I did come across, but I didn't use it, was an image of the wreck lying on the seabed. It's a very, very obscure image. It's very difficult to make it out. But that was the nearest one I got to that. But most of the others I managed to find somewhere. Thank you. Uh, Bina asks, are the parliamentary debates of the 23rd October 1946 an accurate representation of the fate of all known merchant ships that flew the Irish flag during the emergency? Yes, that's a fairly accurate summary of it. Where when I went down through the list in, in response to a parliamentary question on it. But I always think it's, in a way, even though the, their sacrifice was acknowledged then, it still took an awful lot of time before that memorial was, elect, was erected on Arran Key. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for uh, two or three more. First of all, uh, a comment from Jared uh, recommending the book uh, Guarding Neutral Island by Michael Kennedy. Yeah. On the Coast Watching Service and Military Intelligence 1939 to 45. If anyone's looking to, to grow their reading list, that's recommended from, uh, from someone in the audience there. I'll put that in the answered question so you can see that. Um, a question here from Mark. Aside from the losses to indiscriminate mines, are there any accounts of Irish ships being attacked or sunk by friendly fire? The Carlogue famously was. The Carlogue had a most interesting career, the tiny little ship. It activated a magnetic mine in the, in, near Cardiff in 1941, but was not severely damaged. It rescued the crew of the Wild Rose uh, that I mentioned. It was off course in the Bay of Biscay, coming out of the Bay of Biscay, heading for Ireland, when it was spotted by two RAF planes. And it was attacked and strafed, and a couple of the crew were wounded, and the ship was damaged. The um, the Royal Air Force said it was off course. It was where it in an area where it shouldn't have been. It was a legitimate target. And there was a story then. The Carlow famously rescued 164 German sailors from a watery grave in December um, 1943, and brought them to Cork. On its way, it was contacted by radio by the British and ordered to divert to Bristol. But it didn't. It headed for Cork and saved the lives of 164 German sailors who were interned. But there was a story told that early in 1944, the Carlow called into Bristol to get clearance. It had to get what they called a Navy cert, a clearance to go down through the Bay of Biscay from the Royal Navy and it was heading for Lisbon. And somebody made a remark about the Carlo, one of the um, British officers present, that it had got what it, it should have put into Britain to surrender the German sailors, and it got what it deserved when to strafe by the two RAF planes. And that remark created an uproar among the other officers present who leapt to the defense of the Carlo and said, obviously, that guy who made that remark had never been at sea and did not understand the priority of rescuing and of getting them safely ashore. So, so the, the Carlogue was attacked by two RAF planes. That's the only instance of friendly fire that I'm aware of. But then, of course, the Ardmore sunk off the, um, the Salty Islands. I would say on balance, that was probably a drifting mine from the British minefield, but we'll never know. 
we'll never know. Thank you. And I think our last question for this afternoon is from David, um, who, by the way, says that he heard you give an excellent talk um, about the Dublin uh, in, the, in the Dublin Port Company a while back about World War One. Um, he says best regards to a fellow DCU history postgrad. Um, he asks, was there any British attempt to repeat the Q ship ruse of World War One, i.e., armed British ships sailing under false flags of neutrals or as merchantmen? Um, the, the false flag, the Q ships, no, not that I'm aware of. There was no attempt to repeat that. That's not to say that both sides did not make early in the war in September 1939, both sides managed to repeat the mistakes they had made in the First World War. On the 3rd of September, the, a U-boat commanded by Fritz Lemp sunk a passenger liner, the Athena, I think it was, off the coast of Donegal, killing passengers. It had been, the U-boats had been ordered under no circumstances to attack liners. But Lemp did not recognise it as a liner and sank it. And you can imagine the outcry, like as in the Lusitania during the First World War. On the British side, they formed what they called a hunter-killer group centred on an aircraft carrier, the Courageous. Now, hunter-killer groups had been tried in the First World War and had been useless. So they were tried again, and the Courageous was sunk by a sub uh, submarine. The loss of a very important aircraft carrier, repeating mistakes. But to the best of my knowledge, there is no effort to repeat the Q-ships. Even though a lot of the time in the early months of the war, the U-boats would surface and would shell the vessel, sinking with its gun to preserve the limited number of torpedoes that it had on board. But to the best of my knowledge, no Q-ships. Thank you. Uh, one final, final question okay. before we wrap up is from Michelle. Can you tell us anything about the posthumous medals awarded? I can't really. It's, not, uh, it's something that I, I, I'm... I have to apologise, it's not something that I've looked into, but they deserved everything they got, those men. You know, they, any recognition, they really earned it. Thank you. Uh, you've, yeah. It's been such, um, such an interesting talk, really, really informative and such an important topic um, that I think often gets overlooked. So thank you so much, Pat, for that. Um, I think on, on behalf of us all, really, really enjoyed it this afternoon. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming and watching today. Um, this is the second of three talks that are being run in partnership with the Dublin Port Company. And the third and final one of those is taking place this Thursday at 5 p.m. And that is the shaping of Dublin Port in the 19th century with Eamon O'Reilly. And there still are tickets available for that. So do go on to the festival websites and, um, and get some of those as well as plenty other events that are happening um, over the course of the next few days. So it just remains for me to thank you once again, Pat, and thank you all for tuning in and hopefully we'll see you at more events over the next few days. Have a lovely evening.